they're going to kick this off. Talking about resulting trusts. Resulting trusts are the first of two topics on trusts through operation of law. And with a lot of things in this subject, there seems to be a little bit of jumping around, going backwards and forwards between topics, which makes it kind of difficult to structure it in a very, very clear week by week fashion. Uh, as a result, you've already been exposed to one of the types of resulting trusts when we talked about Barclays Bank and Chris Goddess. Um, that idea of where there's some overt purpose, you result back to the set law. Now, um, I put my hands up and say this is not uncommon in disciplines where you learn some stuff and then later on the people who's teaching you say, oh, we actually lied. We lied about this, well, or at least we explained it in a slightly less confusing way. And then later on, you get some more information, some of which can contradict that earlier stuff. Because if you stop and think about it, when we think about resulting trusts, how does that work with the beneficiary principle? Um, and what you find about this area is that the more you delve into it, the more you see that it operates it's something of a hack in many ways. Judges will go and explain the different classifications of resulting trusts in different ways. And there's no real consensus, certainly not amongst your, um, your textbooks. Those that have got both DuPont and Evans, you'll find this is explained in quite different ways. I don't know if people have got both. And so as um, I like to think the analogy is when you do um, those have done physics, you do physics, you learn about the laws, Newton's laws, you learn about accelerating objects with a constant force, and that works all very fine and well. And then you hit stage one at university and they turn around and say, oh no, actually we lied. We lied, well, turns out when you get close to the speed of light, things operate quite a bit differently. Um, thanks, Einstein. And uh, I think that this area, this turning of the corner in the subject kind of reflects that and that we're doing things that are, are different, they operate differently to express trust. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of analogies that flow from this, but it's tricky to try and think of stuff in terms of how we worked in terms of intention and how we worked in terms of beneficiaries. So just uh, leave that on the back of your mind. But nonetheless, we did get exposed to the first of these types of, um, of uh, resulting trusts, because which fundamentally, things that must be done by the court. If we think about an express trust where we've gone and got a deed, we don't have to go anywhere near the courts. In fact, it's one of the almost unusual things that the amount of property that you can go and do and have a trust deed that never needs to be registered. You guys actually stop and think about that. There's no system where you can go and check whether or not you're a beneficiary of a particular trust. Does that strike you as odd in some ways? Because it's something I think you might, might want to tuck in the back of your mind. You guys are probably people in this room here who are the beneficiaries of trust and you've never seen the instrument because that's the purpose of trust law. It's not supposed to be for you. You're, the, you're supposed to get the benefit of it. You're not, you don't have to know anything about the administration of it. Resulting trust though, must be done by the court. And in situations where the things are having to go to court, there are going to be multiple parties and wanting a variety of outcomes. Usually with a resulting trust, one side wants to get a resulting trust, and the other side doesn't. And when we learn more about law and particular legal practice, we become acutely aware that when you rock up to court, sure, one of your arguments is going to be that this is a result in trust. But you might have a variety of other arguments that are going to be pleaded at the same time. You heard that phrase, co-pleaded. Um, the main one for our concerns here is uh, constructive trust, which we're going to talk about next week. Um, but in some situations, you're going to be arguing that for example, in terms of writing, there may have been sufficient intention evinced in writing to satisfy, for example, 111A, the property law act, when you're going and transferring property. Um, 
Sometimes that'll work and sometimes it won't. Because we're aware when we're setting up an express trust that that has to meet the requirements of writing in order to vest legal title. Resulting trusts and constructive trusts happen when stuff hasn't worked. Something's broken down. And the first sort of broad categories of these we've talked about in, in depth in the Quisco's case. As you guys probably recall, that was where uh, an amount of money was paid into the bank accounts of a company called Rolls Razor for them to fulfill the express purpose of paying dividends to shareholders. The company got liquidated and there the court, and, and again, there's a lot of controversy about this at the time, the court said, look, looking at this thing as a whole, the purpose uh, of this particular transaction, and in particular the intention of all of the parties in relation to it, it was clear that that was specified for a purpose. We are gonna characterize that as a trust, and the beneficial interest is still held by the lender in that situation. And so that idea of a resulting trust, because if we stop and think about the purpose of this, remember we talked about purposes, have to, the beneficiary principle says you've either got a beneficiaries or you've got to have a purpose. Well, neither of those things really applied in regards to the shareholders. Um, not, neither of this certainly weren't charitable. Um, and the idea of this things being and having a beneficial interest actually doesn't really work. It wasn't an express trust. It's only after we've rocked up to court do we say, oh, there actually was a trust. Is it, Maria, is that flickering? Is that flickering? I'm not sure why. Or whether that's the, um, the screen or it's YouTube or my streaming, I'm not sure. Okay, um, this, as well as having this purpose, this sort of kind of, kind of murky sounding area where a purpose is made clear to all those involved in a particular transaction, um, the other huge, there's two very, very large areas, enough to warrant an entire lecture for talking about some of the resulting trusts, is this. Uh, failure, what's called failure to dispose of beneficial interests, where a ben beneficial interest is somehow uh, orphaned, for want of a better word. That's one area. And uh, the other one is to do with property. Uh, now, I, I'll just make note of that before we talk in a lot more depth about this beneficial interest part, but that definition of property, uh, the cases that, that are all there, uh, to do with real property. And when I learned this 10 years ago, I was under the impression that it was only real property. Um, but it turns out it actually might be broader than that. However, all of the cases we look at are all to do with land. I'll leave that on the back of your mind. Okay. And so this oh, second category on the slide here, that where they're talking about uh, beneficial interests that don't go anywhere. Now remember that for trusts, we have to have either beneficiaries or a charitable purpose. We've got an express trust. This thing has to go somewhere. It's an element of having a trust. And so if you've somehow satisfied the elements, here's uh, beneficiaries or here's a particular charitable purpose and it can't go somewhere, that's a problem. That's a problem because the whole point of a trust is to separate the legal and the equitable title. If there's no person or no purpose allocated to the equitable title, the courts can't do anything with that. It's not a trust, or at least it's not an express trust. So, um, this Gillingham's Bus Disaster Fund superficially sounds like some of the other cases that we had, like the Cyclone Tracy case, the Darwin, um, Darwin Cyclone Tracy case. And there, there were 24 victims of a bus crash. Um, they were army cadets, I think. Uh, and so a um, fundraiser was made and people, it was a combination again of anonymous and non-anonymous donors. It's again, very familiar sounding situation. Uh, and once again, those thing, needs had been satisfied of those list people according to what the, um, the terms of that trust were. 
then they're stuck with a problem. Oh, hey, we've got a whole bunch of money left over. And it had to go off to court. And the court looked at this. Now, there's a doctrine when you've got a charitable purpose and you can't fulfill that purpose to push it to a similar one. What's that called? It's my terrible explanation. It's the sea prey doctrine. It's that idea that with a charitable purpose, you can push things that have gone to one expressed stream of char charity to a slightly different one to resolve the practical problem. And that only works for charitable trusts and only works where it's a practical defect, not a legal one. Here though, the court said, we can't do that. This is expressed in a particular way to not be charitable. It's not charitable in the nature that it's construed and the way the instruments has been set up. As such, the money is going to result back. And the actual mechanism, they said, is that the money had to be paid into court. Now, I don't know if you've heard that expression before, but in some circumstances, the court looks after money. It's pretty rare, but you can do it. Uh, those that have studied I think equity, actually, you do a moot. I'm not sure as part of that moot where you have to, uh, in terms of the providing of sureties. Does this sound familiar? Where um, you've got an injunction or something along those lines, one of the mechanisms for seeking a, an injunction, um, an urgent injunction, is that you can pay money into court. Does that sound familiar? Well, okay. You can do that as part of that process. You pay the money, essentially, to the Department of Justice. They look after it. And that's what happened with this Reed Gilligan's bus uh, thing. said, look, the fact that it's going to take a bit of time for this money to go back to the donors isn't going to stop us uh, here. Pay the money into court. It's going, this trust has failed. We can't offload this beneficial interest to these people or, or, to, or use Cypre to push it off to a charitable purpose. Pay the money back to the court and the court will allocate it back to those donees in that case. And if it can't, it goes to the Crown. I think it's a public trustee in Queensland, but I'm not sure. Okay. And uh, that, that, that's the starting point for this, uh, for this particular case. But the big case in resulting trust in terms of beneficial interest is this guy, Mr. Vanderbilt. And so there's a series of these cases, uh, three or four, and they involve Mr. Vanderbilt. Uh, this is the, I think it says number two, but I think it's actually the third one um, because it went on appeal. And so we're going to have to talk about Mr. Vanderbilt's case in a little bit more depth in terms of the facts um, because there's a fair amount to it. And I regret that I do not have the memory, particularly in terms of numbers uh, that Tom has in his head. So I'm going to do actually go and tell you what the numbers are from actual real notes uh, that I kept. But the starting point was this guy, um, Mr. Vanderbil, who was a very successful businessman. Um, he was a successful businessman. What was his name? Tony? Tony businessman. And um, he... And one of the annoying things about this is I have to talk about the earlier cases before we get to the latter one. He wanted to, later in his life, go and give, you know, do some good things, do some good in the world. And so <laughs> he, um, he wanted to do something to create a chair uh, in the, school, uh, the college or school of pharmacology at one of the local universities. Um, sorry, the Royal College of Surgeons. And he got some legal advice and the, the key thing from all of this is that um, the legal advice he got was pretty poor uh, in regards to this. Look, they gave it a go, but they hadn't really thought a lot of these things through. Um, now, what he did in regards to this um, funding this chair, you guys are aware what a chair means? Chair is a professor, professorial role where a pot of money is allocated for a person. So in academia, you have you know, lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor. Those are all roles determined under you know, Fair Work Act and the university promotion system. You can't become a professor 
unless there is a chair. So it's a technical term to refer to a pot of money. Um, sometimes that's actually allocated by the universities themselves, but it's usually not. Okay, and so he wanted to fund this, and so he had, a, but he didn't want to pay cash. And look, all of this, by the way, was to try and really outfox the UK's Inland Revenue uh, Commissioner. So these involve the revenue in some way, and they're trying to bypass this. And so the, the villain, the other side, the respondent in a lot of these cases, is actually the IRC. They're the ones trying to make him pay tax and stuff. And so the, um, the starting point was for, which was Vanderbilt's number one, in the 1960s, was that to fund this chair, he took uh, 100,000 100, shares? Yeah, 100,000 shares to his company and transferred that to the Royal College of Surgeons. Okay, so he took 100,000 shares. And so with the idea being is that the dividends from that can fund the chair. And if you're paying out income, towards an education purpose, what's that going to fall under in terms of trust law? It's charitable. It's the second liver pencils case. That part's going to be fine. Okay, so he, um, he did this and it paid a large amount of dividends. So was it up to 1961, it was 245,000 um, pounds. And one of the things that he'd put in the instrument and to his, uh, uh, essentially the advice of the solicitors was to, to do this, was that, look, we can do it for a while, but we want to place an option in this instrument for these shares to be repurchased. So we want to put, when we do this gift, we want to say, look, we retain this right to repurchase these shares back from the Royal College of Surgeons at a later stage. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is that's a contractual right. That's a contractual right that has value. And because while this option to repurchase um, could be exercised, they didn't map out in the instrument how this was going to work in terms of the beneficial interests of that. Who has the beneficial interest of this contractual right to repurchase? This was the real problem that they had there. Because if you think about it, a right, a contractual right to do something, particularly to purchase a big chunk of shares at a very, very low sum of money, I think it was up to repurchase at like 5,000 pounds or something very small. Um, that contractual right has value and if it's exercised, where do the shares go? Look, who's going to be holding those things? You've set this trust up for the benefit of these um, and you've retained this contractual right somewhere because the set law can't have it because they've created the trust. The trustees can hold it, but they're only holding the legal title. Who has the beneficial interest of this contractual right to repurchase? And the way that the taxing statutes worked in the UK at the time, and the reason why the ISA was after him, was that that um, hidden or missing or beneficial value that was retained in this case by the set law, he would be liable to pay tax on. And so in Vanderbilt number one, when they're looking at this beneficial interest, he lost, he lost and he had to pay tax on those things as a result. Now, one of the arguments that was raised in that was that, oh, well, uh, I mean, we actually uh, intended to allocate this right orally. Because at this stage, when the IADs you know, rocking up, as you do, you go, oh no, um, you know, the, IAD, or the, was it the IRC, they've actually got a very valid point. So they tried to reduce some oral evidence that this had been moved elsewhere, this right had been moved elsewhere. What's the trouble with that? What would the equivalent problem be in Queensland in terms of sections? In the Property Law Act, assignment of property, equitable property, has to be done in writing. That idea of this, you know, certain types of choices in action, in common law and equity, have to be done in writing. The fact that you could use oral evidence to it is, doesn't make any difference at all. It doesn't get assigned. Um, 
Okay, so he lost at that stage and something happened between the next time this came up uh, in the House of Lords, which was in the uh, seven, well, early 70s. It took a long time to go through the courts. So, well, it says 1974. I think they started a long time before this. Um, something happened in that time. He died. Um, Tom mentions tongue-in-cheek. Probably all the stress of the litigation killed him. Uh, and so this um, next case is a little bit more complex. Okay. Because um, here, we're trying to resolve the issue with this first case in terms of who's going to uh, essentially own both the beneficial and legal title in terms of the uh, of this contractual right that has value. Who's going to do this? Uh, well, he, um, he instructed his trustees to take money, take money from his kids' trusts, so their beneficial interest for their trust, to go and repurchase this thing. Okay, and again, tax office took umbrage with this and they took him up to the high court and then it went on appeal and the ID or the IRC won in the lower case um, because they're looking at and where this beneficial interest sat and you guys are aware that when you're transferring property like in Queensland for example there's things like stamp duty in regards of relation to that and here they're trying to determine not just the transfer stuff, but also how and where the dividends are going to flow as a result of who holds this particular option. And this, um, when the thing went appeal, on appeal to the House of Lords, he, or he, or well, he's dead by the stage, his executors, uh, they won. And they won because although it's not clear from the, um, from the facts of the story, the fact that he'd used it and used his children, uh, and again, they'd done it through creating a separate entity too, to purchase that as well, um, meant that they were the ones that were doing it. Him, as the settlor at this stage, is no longer involved. And so there, in terms of this option, it can, do, it can and did result back to, to them as a result. Um, I think what the amount of money was it was a lot. Mm. Um, I think the the revenue we're trying to get them because by this stage, when you've got a large packet of shares and their company is doing well, it's earning a whole bunch of dividends distributions that are supposed to be taxable and if they're not going to a charitable purpose then that um, those amounts are going to be taxed and so the, the IRC was turns out was actually looking for 600,000 pounds which is you know, quite a lot of money um, at that stage um, there they did find though that that, um, that particular transfer or arrangement because it had been done through the kids themselves so had gone and moved those things it was no longer uh, was outside the scope of him as a set law and it is going on and moving to them um, so they the fact that they were then holding the equitable right to, um, to repurchase the, the shares meant that as a result it wasn't a result of him so his estate in that situation wasn't liable to pay uh, tax for that um, it yeah, there's a lot to it in regards to these um, you know, these the idea of having these beneficial interests and in this situation trying to work out how and where they end up um so i um i'll just have to note that i um i put this next case here which is the gina reinhardt case in under the purchase monies part but it kind of relates to this part as well um all right because vanderville's in terms of how and where the beneficial interest sits when it can't go for whatever reason out to a particular person or a particular purpose and it results back um, it, in that situation it's going to be a failure um, a failure to whatever is expressed or um, 
divest your beneficial interest on to your a list of whatever particular beneficiaries are. And the other broad category of trust or times where this result in trust comes up is when you advance money to the purchase of property. Now, uh, Gina Reinhardt's had a few cases over the years where she um, and her family have had to trot up, uh, often to the High Court, um, although this one, uh, the family law matter, I think the major judgment's the Western Australian Supreme Court judgment, because I don't think they actually went, this one went to the High Court. It's just a, um, it was refused leave. Because the other major area where trusts, um, results in trusts are created is when people have given money to others to purchase property. This happens all the time. Um, it's actually happened to me. Uh, where, again, here we're generally thinking of real property in terms of actual land and buildings. Um, but in theory, this principle will apply all over. All of the cases involve real property though. Why? Because real property goes up in value. And this is the real um, fundamental reason why this area of law starts to be important. Because the starting point is, if you give money to someone to purchase real property, by default, you can go back to the court if things fall over and ask them for that fraction of that real property. A purchase money's resulting trust, PMRT, will apply in those situations. This is the starting point. And as you can imagine, there's a whole bunch of exceptions to this, but the starting point to note is that the third classification or times that a resulting trust will pop up is where purchase monies are advanced by parties and the legal title doesn't align with the fraction, the percentage that is advanced. Um, perhaps it might be easier to start with block and block, which is uh, factually a little bit simpler than good old Gina Reinhardt. Because in block and block, you had a son, and one of the blocks is the son, and the other block is the parents. It might just be one of the parents at this stage, but two parents, one son, and they, the son did a lot of work in PNG. They lived in Brisbane, I think. Brisbane and did a lot in PNG and parents were, um, I wouldn't say concerned, but they wanted to really help him out in you know, getting him on his way and help him out by um, putting some money up and then he would put up the rest of the money and pay the mortgage off for a block of flats in Brisbane. And you know, that's, that seems like a reasonable sort of a thing to do for your kids. And so in the early 70s they did this, they paid some, some of the money, like, like $12,000 and the property doubled in value um, within quite a short space of time. And look, a lot of these things that come up in terms of family matters, where things are done orally. And as we're aware, doing things orally in regards to trust law, or in fact anything that's required to be in writing, is a problem. It's a problem with express trusts, 111A of the Property Law Act. And so here, they parents advanced uh, 19 sixtieths, um, 19 sixtieths of the property to the son. Yep, 19, one nine sixtieths. So if you divided the value of the property, it will say you know, $12,000 divided by that would be um, to, what's a sixtieth of that? $200? Doesn't sound right. 60th of 12,000, $2,000 to $200. Anyway, 60th, it was 19 60ths of the price. It's just under two thirds. It's actually a relevant point, uh, as I'll get back to. It's just under a third that the parents lent and the son, uh, through a combination of mortgage and cash, uh, did the rest. And the 
the, key, the reason why it's important is that they had an arrangement, an agreement, that it would be, in terms of all of the rent and the payment and everything like that, two thirds, one third. Parents would be doing and getting one third, and the child would be getting and doing two thirds. Sounds pretty straightforward, except the, the numbers didn't quite align. They were close, but they didn't quite align. So it was 19 sixtieths, and so the son had 41 sixtieths. With, with all of these sorts of cases, at some stage later, it um, uh, went pear-shaped. And the, um, the son and the parents have a falling out, and the thing needed to be litigated. And this, uh, even though I've got the ALR citations, I'm not sure why the ALR, it did go to the High Court, because they did go through and map this out. And they essentially went through and restated a whole series of principles that go from a very, very long time. Um, the first thing to note when you're doing things in regards, in regards to your children, what is the presumption when you are doing things and giving money? It's the presumption of advancement. I'm in Queensland. Advancement. So, by default, the law will construe the six, uh, 1960ths that the parents paid as a gift. It's a rebuttable presumption. The parents that, that did the transfer, they are the ones that have to rock up and rebut that. Okay, and the way you do that doesn't strictly have to be through writing, although it helps. They have an instrument that says this. Um, you are allowed to adduce oral evidence, and again, remember, you guys doing this via test, whether or not you can adduce evidence of unlawful purpose, um, uh, rights, uh, perpetual executism right, and Nelson and Nelson. Mac Nelson and Nelson's there. And so they were able to go through and demonstrate this. Look, they adduced evidence that there was this profit-making scheme. They had the scheme. They actually, I think they actually had a written document as well there somewhere. Um, where they'd mapped it out. The, the parents were able to rebut the presumption of advancement. And this area of law says that look, if you do manage to do that, then a purchase money's resulting trust is created. Um, and I'll talk about the mechanical aspects of, of this at the end, but it re essentially is just putting the, um, the guy, or what's his name, uh, I can't remember the young guy's name, the son in the situation essentially of a trustee. He still had legal title, of course, but they had the beneficial interest. Now, the difficulty was that the High Court said, oh, they agreed on two-thirds, one-third, so we're going to map it out as two-thirds, one-third. So the parents got a one-third interest in this. And the High Court later on criticised this in Nelson and & Nelson and, uh, and a few other cases. said, look, we did that wrong. Because with purchase monies resulting trusts, when you advance purchase monies for the purpose, and again, here I'm thinking of real property, but probably would extend to um, others as well. When you advance um, cash, or, as so we'll get to the next slide, when you do it in terms of agreeing to get a mortgage, it's that fraction that matters. The fraction that you put up matters. I got called an idiot because I purchased real property just around the corner and I put it in my well, now ex-partner's name and which is fine. I think people can call me whatever they like but if you're aware of these sorts of rules it didn't bother me at all in any way shape or form. Um, why? Because they construe these things tightly. The courts construe the payment of money towards real property, those fractions, cleanly and tightly. And the court essentially overruled that component of block and block, where they talked about the profit-making scheme being two-thirds, one-third. Well, then that it doesn't matter. The amount that was paid by the parties is the fraction that we are going to apply when creating this resulting trust, this trust through operation of law and making the person with legal title become the trustee. So the amount that you pay in matters. That percentage matters. Um, 
end. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I might take a break there actually. Even though it's only one slide um, for a few minutes, just a couple of minutes, and then I'll come back and talk about Gina Reinhardt because, again, there's quite a lot in that. Okay.
Hancock family seem to be a, a colourful bunch. Uh, I've only really known about them since I've lived in Australia, but they seem to have pervaded the business landscape and uh, um, informed Australian culture to some extent for quite some time. Um, so there was a guy, Lane Hancock, who had a lot of money. He was a mining magnate. Uh, and he had a daughter called Gina, who's I think at the moment is still Australia's wealthiest person. I could be wrong. Uh, having some difficulties with trust law at the moment is, is Gina, but these particular ones uh, are the ones we're talking about. We'll do her stuff a little later when, when we study trustees. And in the early 80s, Lang Hancock was old. He was uh, late in the 70s, I think. And he had, um, uh, his daughter actually organized to get a housekeeper, Rose, Rose Porteous. Um, and he, she organized for her to come in and help out, help laying around. And so after not too long, they developed a relationship and Gina and her, Gina and Rose uh, very quickly, intensely disliked each other. And particularly Gina didn't like the uh, impact and the affection and the gifts that were lavished upon uh, Rose while her father was still alive. And as part of going through and doing this, um, they, uh, he went and basically bought her a whole bunch of properties. And then what happened was they, uh, um, the way that this had been engineered was they were bought with money from the Hancock companies. So a couple of companies that uh, the, the Hancock family had and run and controlled. And Lane Hancock was the, uh, the sort of the general all-powerful director. He had the absolute authority to do that uh, as, the, as the director for those companies. Okay, so we did. They took Hancock money from these two uh, companies and went and spent it on houses that he put in Rose's name. Okay, what's the problem with that? Well, on the face of it, uh, those that have studied company law will know that's a breach of fiduciary duty. And so one of the arguments that was raised here is this is a breach of fiduciary duty. And as such, we can argue as one of the remedies for a breach of fiduciary duties is constructive trust. Stuff we'll do next week. Uh, that failed. And the reason that it failed was because it turns out that he hadn't, strictly speaking, used company money to do that. He had gone <laughs> and done it as a loan. So he had loaned money to purchase all of those properties. An arm's length loan is fine. An arm's length loan is fine in terms of the amounts. And this was the kind of cheeky bit that was advanced. And again, Lang himself has long since died. This is by the executor, uh, or people sitting in the shoes of that, on behalf of Rose Porteous at this stage, Rose Hancock, um, was that the money that was advanced was actually structured as a loan and not, strictly speaking, the Hancock companies purchasing the, those particular properties. Because one of the things that you find, if it's money that's purchased for something and you still, uh, you as the purchaser, have gone through to um, purchase stuff, this purchase money's trust can arise. So that you, even though you can put it in someone else's name, they made these arguments that look, that is actually purchased on behalf of these companies. It's two companies, right? But these actions failed. I said they failed because it was structured as a loan and they were actually able to argue that the repayment of the loan had been satisfied. And it was through, I mean, when looking at this, what seems like a, a bit of a stretch the argument there was, and this was evinced in writing, they had, they had pretty good lawyers, did, uh, uh, did Lang Hancock. They said that, look, during his time as the general director for all of these companies, 
he did a lot of overtime. And so to recoup that, or essentially as payment for that overtime, the, um, you know, if they're to be paid, he's, what he could have been paid this amount of money. But instead of doing that, we're just gonna offset all of these loans. We're just gonna cancel the contractual right to call in those loans. So the loans were paid back in inverted commas through that mechanism. And that got upheld, and I said, and special leave was not granted to go to the High Court in regards to this stuff. So the action by essentially Gina and her, um, her side of the family actually failed against Rose Porteous in making either of those arguments, either that it was a breach of fiduciary duty and it should be a constructive trust, and, or that it was purchase monies that were advanced and it should have been a purchase monies trust. Neither of those things applied. Um, first one, because it was, in both situations really, because it was a loan. If you're lending money at arm's length with a reasonable market rate of interest, that is not going to create a purchase monies resulting trust. Okay, if you're lend, doing it as an arm's length loan, this thing won't apply. And that kind of makes sense, otherwise the bank, everybody would have um, purchase monies trust in relation to real property. Because your bank, when you go and buy a property, because there's a young fella, they advance you, you know, 80, 90% of, of the cash to purchase it anyway. So that, would be, that wouldn't work mechanically. All right. So a couple of things, when I say a couple, about 10 things we need to know. In terms of purchase monies, um, resulting trust, PMRTs, uh, is this distinction between family and strangers, and it relates to the presumption of advancement, but it's this idea that when you're going and giving money to somebody to buy a house, you, know, you don't do this out of the goodness of your own heart, even if you put it in their name. Um, and so uh, Napier and the um, uh, public trustee, this went to the High Court as well, um, and the, uh, the decision from um, Justice Aiken in that situation makes the point, the law with respect to resulting trust is not in doubt. When property is transferred by one person into the name of another without consideration, and where a purchaser pays the vendor and directs him or her to transfer the property into the name of another person without consideration, passing to that person, there is a presumption that the transferee holds the property upon trust for the transferor or the purchaser, as the case may be. All right, and then carries on to talk about the presumption of advancement. This proposition is subject to the exception that in the case of transfers, this is important because these words matter here, to a wife or a child, there is a presumption of advancement so that the beneficial as well as the legal title will pass. Um, I don't know if you can remember back to your contract law days about the rule in Yerke and Jones to do with um, undue influence in relation to married couples where a wife, and only a wife, can seek to have a particular transfer where there's a guarantee where she can demonstrate that she didn't fully understand the document. Um, and that, sadly, is still good law. Good meaning that it's valid and hasn't been overruled or changed by the High Court. And so the overwhelming um, sort of cases that come from this is that this area of law is actually gendered. Um, another thing to note is that Napier actually involved a, um, uh, a de facto couple. So when you're trying and you're looking and examining this area of law, by default, de facto couples are considered strangers. When we're thinking about purchase money as a result in trust, the court is vastly happier to set one of these things up when the two people are not married. Um, does this sound a little outdated? Yes, it is. But appreciate that a lot of this law has to be read in the context of the contemporary statutory framework, which is the Family Law Act. And so a lot of these um, mechanisms and these rules that we talk about in terms of trust law, yes, they are strictly strict speaking, the common rules of common law and equity, 
but in practical terms, you resolve these sorts of disputes under the Family Law Act. Statute is going to trump rules of common law and equity. These are the starting points though. Okay, uh, just uh, a key thing to note here is, um, and this comes from Calvert and Green, when you're advancing purchase monies to set up this purchase monies resulting trust, and again, think about the fractions. When, when two sides are advancing these monies, um, the amount that you pay up front is cash. Clearly, that's going to influence or be the fraction that you're going to do, but it's also the amount that you promise to repay a bank. Because essentially, if you think about this, when you're getting a loan from a bank, you're borrowing a sum of money and giving it to the other side. The fact that you have to go and repay that later, um, that doesn't form part of this area of law. And so just make note that when mortgage payments are made, that doesn't change the way PMRTs work. It just doesn't. So just, again, it does in family law, those that have studied family law with Diane, the amount that you repay in mortgages goes towards the contribution amounts, but it doesn't in trust law. When you're trying to go and argue a PMRT, the amount that you um, borrow from the bank, and put towards the purchase, is the amount that they will look at when they work out these fractions. Um, it seems like a real simple point, but that trips people up because it's not, strictly speaking, intuitive. It's not, it's just not. When we think about what's fair, one person, um, for example, gets the mortgage in their name and the other person makes all the repayments, who's gonna get, in trust law anyway, who's gonna get the benefit? The person whose name was on the mortgage to start with it. The person, in theory, the person who's repaying it all, loses out. So just leave this on the back of your mind. It's not about the repayment of mortgages or the paying of the interest off on these things, it's about the cash up front when the purchase is made. Um, but so there's other areas of law that you can use to offset the payments you've clearly made in relation to that. There's the Family Law Act, um, and there's also this idea of constructive trust. Hey, sure, you've got the PMRT, but all of the payments that I've made in order to reduce the debt on this, that can be taken into account by the court when you create a constructive trust in regards to those. Okay. Um, the presumption of advancement. Um, I'm actually going to start with the one at the bottom because it might be um, uh, might be one of the more interesting ones because it involves a barrister. So there was a barrister who had purchased a house with uh, jointly with his wife. So had purchased purchased a property with his wife in the nineteen early nineteen seventies. All right, and it was a barrister, but she for whatever reason, whether she came from a wealthy family, he actually contributed, I think, 76% of the purchase monies. Uh, and uh, a bit later on in the late 80s, they um, converted, uh, whatever it is, or they made avert the uh, change for the two of them to bring it to, to make it 50-50, moving it to, I think it was, they moved it to a joint tenancy. Um, and they... Um, there was, a, there was a, a problem with this though. The, the problem was at some stage later, uh, I think, or was it 2006, so the early part of the century, the tax office caught up with Mr. Cummins. When I say caught up with him, he was a barrister. He hadn't done a tax return for 44 years. You think, you think a barrister who literally took briefs for the tax office, you'd think that this would catch up with you at some stage. And as you could imagine, well, in fact, you don't even need to imagine, you can just look at the name of the case. Uh, it was a very large amount of tax. 
that was uh, outstanding. And so Mr. Cummins was made bankrupt. And so the reason why this thing came up and why it was um, went all the way, again, all the way to the High Court he here, was um, these presumptions, this idea of making and having a presumption when purchasing the marital home. So if you come, yep. There are these presumptions that when you purchase the marital home, that it's done as joint tenants. And you might recall this distinction between joint tenancy and tenancy in common, with the idea being joint tenants both co-own the property and the right of survivorship applies. You can't alienate your fraction of a joint tenancy at common law anyway. Bit of land law revision, never hurt anyone. And so what we re you recall though is that in the 70s when they purchased this, she had actually contributed 76%. So she had actually contributed more than him. And you could imagine that a house that was bought by a barrister in the early 1970s, by the time this went to court uh, 10, 15 years ago, was now worth a significant sum of money. And I, again, I, I really want to stress the point, the percentages matter. And so this thing went to the High Court because the argument was from the Cummins family was that he only had 24, 24, 25, 26, 27%, about a quarter of the purchase monies at the time. So she put up 76%, he put up 24%, Therefore, that fraction should be preserved. This was the argument the Cummins um, family put up, Mrs. Cummins put up. That fraction should be preserved because, um, hey, you know, you purchase money's result in trust. We do this when you're doing things in trust law, when you're doing PMRTs, that fraction should be maintained. And the High Court said, no, no, it's not going to work like that. Sorry about that. It has to be 50-50. Um, and the fact that you literally changed it in the late 80s, you literally went through to try and change this to make it clear um, at that point in time, that evidence is very damning. Um, not that it matters anyway, because the default rule is with married couples, which they were at the time, is that it's going to be 50-50. And so there, again, the argument here is, of course, the tax office is trying to claw back uh, the gap between so the 24% that he did own, which they were always going to get, and the difference between that and getting up to 50. So whatever that is, 26% of this house, which was going to be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Does that make sense, just in terms of the numbers? I'm always worried when we talk about numbers in law school, but it's the, just the idea that, look, it was, it was enough money to warrant it going all the way to the high court court said in that situation, nah, -uh, not only is there a presumption of joint tenancy, but also uh, you've adduced evidence that you actually want it to be 50-50. And look, at the end of the day, yeah. um, when you are coming into, in, you know, coming to the courts of equity, do so with um, clean hands. The fact that your husband didn't do a tax return for 44 years. Thanks, I know. Um, is quite relevant there. Okay, um, there is some case law that says that the presumption of advancement uh, will apply to fiancés. Um, it's worth and worth. Um, in that situation, the um, the lad, not sure how bright he was, but his he again advanced some money to his, um, oh, sorry, they, him and his fiancée purchased a property. And one of the things that she sort of said, uh, maybe she had a fair amount of sway over them, was that, oh, in, in my family, the women have legal title of all of the, uh, of, all, all of the houses. And so he, you know, dutifully registered the real property in his name. Look, they subsequently married, but they were fiancés at that time. 
And so when at some stage later, things go pear-shaped, trying to turn around and argue, oh, fiancés are strangers, therefore, at that point in time, when the money was advanced and we put it in just her name, that's not going to count. And of course, they said, no, no, not in that situation. That, the presumption advancement will apply in that situation. Um, and again, I, I, I actually think the UK position might be different in regards to that. But it's particularly problematic when you actually do marry afterwards. Um, okay. Uh, just notice the onus. Where you've got, um, when you've got a situation where a PMRT might arise and you've got a familial relationship, the person who's in the familial relationship only needs to prove that. I just need to prove that I am your wife, you are my husband. That's all I need to do. The other side has all of the burden. They have the onus of trying to rebut the presumption of advancement. It's a status-based um, factor. All right. Now, one of the things that, uh, like, to be honest, I don't think is actually covered particularly well, we weren't taught, but I have learned in practice, is what happens next. So if you've got these situations where a resulting trust has arisen, either through a failure of purpose, a Quisco style one, a failure to dispose of a beneficial interest, a Vanderbilt style one, or a purchase money's resulting trust, PMRT, uh, block and block, those three situations. The, um, it, it may be really helpful for you guys from a practical sense to try and work out what happens next. Because up to this point in the subject, we've been looking at trustees as being these people who do things out of the goodness of their own heart. You're taking on all of the burdens of owning legal uh, property, all of, of having legal title, having to do all of the stuff. And somebody else, the owner of the beneficial interest, gets all of the good bits, the rent and the um, capital and so on. And so we've got to flip this around a little bit when we're thinking about these resulting trusts. Because if you've managed to rock up to court, which you have to do to get a resulting trust, and you've managed to prove that a resulting trust exists, and this person who currently has legal title, they hate you in most situations. They are now your trustee. They are the trustee of the property in regards to you as the beneficiary. And if they start to do things to detract from that, what's that a breach of? Their fiduciary duties. The law. Yep. Um, they can do in those situations here. And again, it depends on how reasonable the trustee acts from that point. Um, but make note that when we're thinking particularly of family relationships and particularly in terms of real property, there's a real genuine challenge or difficulty here. For example, um, you know, block and block. Okay, the parents have now got one third, should have been 1960ths, but they're assuming that they've got one third of this property and the son is now, with legal title, is now the trustee. What happens? Can they demand it? Can they demand that they be paid? And the answer is no. Remember that with um, the, the rules in terms of being able to actually get your beneficial interest, what would happen? Well, how would you be able to do that? Well, the property would have to be sold in order to do that. And in many situations, that can be prejudicial to the other beneficial interest holders. So if we stop and try and just think about how and where this sits in these situations, Often, you can't get your stuff out for a period of time. You'll still get all of, or the, or the appropriate fraction of things like rent. You'll still get an appropriate fraction of, um, uh, so dividends or uh, emblements and so on, that are obscure. 
And when the property is sold, you can demand that to be transferred, the amount, that amount, that fraction to be transferred to you. Um, but essentially, you can't in many situations get that out straight away. Um, it's, it actually comes up a lot in the elder abuse cases. It's a, a string of them in the Queensland Court of Appeal. I've uh, done a lot of research on, sadly. They're all really sad. Where um, the, um, the elderly parent puts up some, um, has a house you know, on their own in an expensive suburb, has deadbeat kids, or even worse, okay kid with a deadbeat wife or husband who they have a, a young family, can't afford to buy a house, it's very expensive to buy in the major cities. Old person says, we'll buy a big house with a granny flat underneath. I'll live in the granny flat till I die, and and then you know then you'll obviously inherit the house. It seems perfectly reasonable, mapped out that way. So they do that. They sell their house in, the, in a, one of the older, leafier suburbs. Put you know, advance funds towards the purchase of a um, house in the western suburbs. And then the relationship sours. So a few years later, the and again, this, the string of cases is often not even the son or daughter. It's often the, um, the wife or husband not being able to get along with the elderly parent. And so the elderly parent gets kicked out. Why? How can they do that? Well, they've got legal title. They kick you out. They put you in a home. They remove you from the premises. And so these things have to go to the court. And they do. They go end up in the, in the Queensland Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal. And in those situations, the courts grant orders that say, here, we are going to essentially create um, a PMRT in those situations. Sometimes it can be a constructive trust that we'll talk about next week of, um, to do with intent, but if it's not, purchase monies matter because and this is this key thing here. Real property often goes up in value. Towns are very unusual in terms of cities where you know, if you bought a house just around the corner, your house prices would have gone down in 10 years. It's quite remarkable. Most major cities Houses go up in value because land is scarce. And so having um, and advancing purchase monies for a property and having that percentage in trust law, you can only win. Just say that again. If you are going and advancing purchase monies and you have paid for a certain fraction of that house, you can only win. What I mean by that is that you can either demand the percentage when the land is sold, or if it's gone down in value, you can demand the amount. It's win-win for you as a beneficial interest holder. I leave that in the back of your mind too. It's one of the reasons why this, this area can be a strategy, even in situations where you're using the Property Law Act. Purchase money as a result in trust can do that. Um, but essentially, it's putting a trustee in place and the trustee doesn't want to do things. And so you do have to be uh, mindful, as um, Yukadel has mentioned, that when trustees breach those fiduciary duties, yes, yes, you can replace them. Um, also note that in terms of, uh, again, I'm thinking um, PMRTs over real property are capable of assignment. So you can go and assign that beneficial interest, um, you know, 199 and 200 of the PLA, assign that beneficial interest in writing with consideration and intention to a third party as well. Okay. Okay. So, while this is the default position in trusts, most of the time you're going to be operating under the family law regime in dealing with family relationships and family breakdowns. Um, purchase monies, trusts, usually arise where there are family relationships. And the reason for that is that when you are doing things at arm's length, in arm's length commercial transactions, it doesn't come up very often where one side loans, you know, puts money towards a property and doesn't have 
in some fraction mapped out is tenancy in common. That just doesn't come up much because it doesn't make commercial sense. So often these things do involve uh, familial relationships. And the things with the Family Law Act is that it's, it, it sort of starts from first principles. One of those principles is the, um, this idea of contribution. And so when you're getting an order, which again can be either as a married couple or as a de facto couple, they are in different sections. 79 is the married one. 90, capital S, capital L, is the, um, is the de facto one. But essentially they go and they look at all of the factors of contribution. They do take into account people taking time off their career. They do take into account, um, particularly over a long period of time, they do take into account purchase monies in relation to stuff, but it's not the be all and end all. When we're looking at this Nivers Trust Law, it's the be all and end all. The amount you put in is the percentage that you're going to get out. Um, and the case that we've already looked at, where they talk about that, was, um, was Kenan and Spry. And there, although in this um, particular situation, uh, as you guys have done the test, are very much aware that it's, it was really to do with um, valuing the mere equity. But the court, you do probably recall in that case, had just massive powers to do a wide variety of things because the Family Law Act lets them do that. So sure, they are arguing in terms of trusts, in terms of how these rights involving a trusts are managed and mapped out. Um, but at the end of the day, the power that the courts get to do these things and to make those orders and to move things and to vest titles and take people's names off mortgages and, and to rearrange stuff is, um, is granted to them under, by the Family Law Act itself. Uh, it's a statutory framework that modifies that. Okay. And... I don't actually have too much else to add on that. Again, I'm not too sure why this is allocated in whole two hours, but given that we're already a week ahead on the lectures, I don't think you guys would mind too much. Um, the key takeaways though with um, resulting trusts is that it creates involuntary trustees, uh, people who don't want to be trustees. That can happen. It, um, with purchase monies, the fractions matter, the percentage, that's put in to the purchase money of, again, particularly real property matters. And that percentage stays the same even when the property increases in value. Um, and that, um, that middle category, the Vanderbilt's category, um, where a beneficial interest can't be given or it somehow gets orphaned, that has to result back to set law for operation of law. Um, those are really the takeaways from this. There we go, I could summarize that in, in about two minutes. So just leave that one in the back of your mind. The purchase monies matter, not the repayment of mortgages. And look, Dom and Nicola do historically put things like that in there. Where they'll be like, here's this person's got the mortgage. This person's in the name of this mortgage. And look, mortgages can be in joint names, and that's fine. But if you've got a, a situation where one person's advanced a deposit, and then the rest is done with a joint mortgage, that can come up too. You have to do a little bit of arithmetic in re regards to that. And don't think that putting things in one person, uh, like having a joint mortgage where only one person pays for it, that this person's not going to get any remedy. They will, but not in this area of law. Um, I think that's an important thing to note as well. Not that there's, there's gross injustice, it's just the starting point. Um, and note the rule that to do with schemes, where you've got a, um, a system like they did in block and block, where they had said the intention was one third, two thirds, but the payments didn't align with that, the court looks at the dollar values that have happened rather than the party's intention because that's how these things arise. Um, often the intention doesn't align with that because you know, at the time when you're putting real property into your fiancé's or your partner's name, you know, you're in love. And so the courts have to step back a little bit and this is the hard and fast series of rules they use for creating these types of trusts. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that.